Hey everybody, welcome to the Base Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, with me today is Lyman Maderos, um, a great bass player I've known uh, just from being in L.A. Uh, we're kind of on the same scene. We know a lot of the same guys, play with a lot of the same people. Um, sometimes, sometimes when I hang with Lyman, we'll just we'll just get going, and we're just talking about people as if everybody knows them. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope, I hope <laughs> that we that we keep the listeners involved and don't alienate anyone who uh does not play with all the same people we play with in los angeles um and i apologize in advance if if we just get going and uh and that's it you know so sorry if we alienate you it's not on purpose um here's my talk with lyman what's your history with that like do you oh dude i my undergrad degree is in classical performance oh really oh yeah concertos excerpts all that stuff all right yeah. What happened? I went to master's for jazz. I went to mas- I got my master's degree in jazz performance. That's what I really wanted to do. But um, where I did my undergrad didn't have a jazz degree. Really? I just knew I wanted to play bass. Where was that? Ball State University. That was your undergrad? Yeah. Okay. It's a small school in India. Are we recording? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the question happened, and now we're just going. Excellent. Yeah. So Ball State University, it's a mid-sized public university in Indiana. And I just kind of went there just because kind of by default, it was kind of close to home and stuff. And when I got there, lucky for me, the, the bass teacher at the time, his name's Hans Sturm, it was his first year teaching and my first year there. And because it was his first year, they hadn't really done any recruiting, right? So there's only like five or six guys in the studio. Okay. And it's not like I had to compete with all these guys because my high school didn't have an orchestra. Okay. So I had never really played upright before. But he kind of admitted me into the studio and let me take lessons with him. You started on electric? I started on electric, yeah. Oh, man. When I was like 12, 13 years old. What was before that? Like, did you just write out, uh, right into bass playing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I was in like a junior high band, you know, yeah. playing bassoon and saxophone bass, and bassoon. stuff. I know. I usually, <laughs> I usually don't tell people that. Don't bust me out. No. Don't, don't tell a bunch of people all that. Good. I played bassoon all through junior high. It's usually, high man, it's funny that it's typically. Uh, like trumpet or guitar, and then everybody lands on bass. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's been what I found. Not uh, from not from doing this, just from like talking to people. Nice. Either they started on trumpet or guitar. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it was weird. My uncle told my mom that I needed to learn guitar before I learned bass, which doesn't really make much sense. But at the time, right. My uncle was taking guitar lessons, and so she like that was the closest authority, you know. So my <laughs> first, my first act actually was an acoustic guitar, but I didn't like playing it at all, right. and I just wanted to get a bass. My dad plays bass, okay, um, and he, he's in Hawaii, and I grew up with mom in Indiana, so we weren't terribly close. But I knew he, you know, he of course was a bass player, so I wanted to right. play bass too. Were you guys in contact at all, or yeah. like when you started playing, were you like, yo, what's going on with this? Not too, no, not too much like that. Not too much like that until okay. I until I kind of became a teenager. But by that time, he like he still played every once in a while, but kind of stopped pursuing yeah. a career sure. in uh, in music. And he's actually like he was then and is still now like a like a local television personality in really? Kona, Hawaii. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. What does he he's do? like the voice of the local. Uh, what do you call it? Tourist channel. So he does all the <laughs> commercials for the local businesses and okay. the community highlight show and everything. And so, so he's a like local celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah local on, on his side of the big island of Hawaii. He's kind okay. of like a local celebrity, That's cool. which is wild because his name is Lyman, too. So when I go and, <laughs> so when I go and visit, everyone's like, hey, Lyman, hey, Lyman. Yeah. And I'm, you know, jerking my neck all around. <laughs> yeah. I, it takes me a couple of days. Remember, they're not talking to me. They're talking to my dad. Yeah, all I get is Ryan Reynolds. Like, they screw up my name and then think I'm someone. <laughs> Never thought yeah. about that. <laughs> oh, Dude, Never I actually have record that. credit as Ryan Reynolds. Nice. It, it became such a joke in this band <laughs> that when the dude released his record, he just put down Ryan Reynolds. That's hilarious. Yeah. See if you can get your SAG card from that. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, I want access to that bank account. Yeah, that's right. That's what, that's what you need. Uh, so I started playing bass, and, uh, and like I said, the, there was no, like, orchestra program, so... I just played bass in garage bands with my buddies all okay. through junior high and high school. Yeah. 
Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, Alice in Chains. All and then from stuff. that to classical. And that, well, see, that that's when I went to Ball State University, and I was like, I just know I wanted to play bass, and it's like, that's really all you could do there. There's a there's a good jazz band, but there was no degree. Okay. And my teacher had just had just graduated with his doctorate, and he was like deep into classical playing and Hans. stuff. And he, Hans, yeah, Hans Sturm, he teaches at the University of Nebraska now. And he was big into like, you need this technical foundation right. before you want to play jazz, which... Looking back is good because I'm because he, he was probably right in a lot of ways. But as far as being a jazz player and understanding jazz harmony and learning tunes and stuff like that, I was kind of fell a little behind the ball. So I try to, ba- you know, when I teach now, I try to try to balance the two. Yeah, I mean, know? because, you ha- I mean, obviously you have to have technique on the instrument, mm-hmm. you know, to you get out. To. Yeah. But then what where do you feel like a, the tipping point would be? You know, between like, okay, you're just studying all this classical rep to get the rep together versus, all right, maybe you got to go learn some tunes. Yeah, exactly. That's that's kind of the question. Right now, I teach in a uh, in a community college in an applied music program, so that's actually a jazz program. Okay. So I, I I'm very conscious of, <clears throat> pardon me, of balancing what. I ask the students to do and what I teach them between technique, which which for me, I don't know how you teach, but on upright is pretty much all classical. Like even I don't care if you never want to do a gig with the bow your entire life. Yeah, you gotta, you're not going to get your left hand together unless you right. have some facility with the bow. So we're sure. just going to start from there. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and work work in that regards. Yeah, I started yeah. upright like late in the game. I think I was. How old was I? Um, I don't know, maybe 19 or 20. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, but I was already I was already working professionally on electric. Okay. So then I added this thing, and I did not want to spend time on the mm. bow like at all. But then That's same funny. thing, I had a teacher like, "Now nah, you gotta." Yeah. This is what it is. Well, see, when I got to Ball State, I'll, I'll never forget this. It's like two weeks into my freshman year, we're all like hanging around our uh, teacher's office in the bass studio and two of the guys come and say, Hey, we're going to go see Ray Brown tonight. Come with, come with us. Yeah. I said, who's Ray Brown. <laughs> and they all kind of looked at me like, just, just come. Right. And my teacher's like, you got to go. So we drove like an hour and a half to, to see Ray Brown in this. I remember they were playing in this weird club that was like in a hotel lobby okay. and we get there. They're like 21 and older. And like, <laughs> I think the major D could just see how like yeah. we were so disappointed and sad. He threw <laughs> some, he just threw some chairs in the back. And he's like, you guys can see it here. Just don't, walk okay. up, you know, and dude, that night changed my life, man. I saw Ray Brown that was play, it. and I was like, "That's what I want to do for the rest of yeah. my life." Who was he playing with? It was Jeff Hamilton and Benny Green. Ooh. It was Jeff Hamilton's actual. I, I talked to him about this. His last gig with Ray on, before he left the trio and okay. started his own thing. What uh, year was that? That was 1994. 94. <laughs> okay, long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. But so like, I went the other way. I was like, I kind of stopped playing electric seriously for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I've, so I've known years. you in town as mainly just an upright guy. Yeah, and a lot of people do, and that's cool. And for, like, a big part of my 20s, I was just playing upright. I, I, I was still, like, in a band in college. I played electric. But okay. especially once I got um, to Western Michigan University, where I did my graduate degree, it was, it was pretty much all just upright. And then yeah. after I moved to L.A., same thing. Right. And then I really didn't start. I always played electric. I always loved playing electric. But it got to a point where it's like... You have to respect that instrument just as much as upright. Yeah. And if you haven't been putting in the time and shedding on that, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you, you can't just fake it. You know what I mean? It's so that that thing, <clears throat> even even like in my personal practice time, the balance between just the two instruments mm-hmm. is like a and then, then crazy. one feeds the other to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. But I think it's easier to go back to electric. So if like you let electric lag a little bit, yeah, I think you're right because it's not as physically demanding. Mm-hmm. That's true, and you know, frets. Let's yeah, be right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole part of playing electric. You don't have to deal with right. when you play with upright your intonation. Yeah, so. oh. but yeah, they're, I mean, they're two different instruments, and they both they both command a certain amount of upkeep to make sure that you're you're, you're proficient on both. Right, and, and they both have their own. Lineage. So you're teaching, what's the class you're teaching at MI? So at MI, a Musicians Institute, I teach a bunch of private lessons. Yeah. And then I teach, it kind of varies quarter to quarter, but I teach a modern R&B class. Okay. And so that's for, um, 
students of every instrument, you know, and they all kind of come together, and I, I have a bunch of transcriptions, a bunch of songs transcribed, and they just learn a new song every week. Okay. And they come in the song, they workshop it, and, you know. How modern is modern? Like how far Modern is like I try to keep it, like, up on it. Like, like on the radio? Like, yeah. Okay. This I haven't I haven't probably done a new arrangement in in a in a few months, but like we just did um, the song we did yesterday was uh, uh, "Free Your Dreams" by Snarky Puppy and Shantae okay. Khan from the First Family Dinner record. Yeah, yeah. And last week we did uh, "I Feel It Coming" by The Weeknd and Daft uh-huh. Punk from that last record that sure. came out last summer. So I try to keep, you know I try to keep that class. Really who cu- who cut the session on that? Do you know who the original bass player was? On which uh, "I Feel It Coming"? I don't think there is bass on that one. There might be. I'm trying to recall the tune now. Got so many of those tunes, man. You can't. Like, I know it was Nathan East on. Uh, oh, on the Daft Punk stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It could be. That's actually But this cool one line. is like, this. I think this is on the weekend's record. So oh. I think it was produced by his guys. Right. And then, and then there's also a bass technique. Uh, bass technique class that I'll teach on electric know, on electric yeah it's pretty much it's all electric at Musicians Institute unless th- we have an upright room and kids can come and if they have questions so there's a, an elective where they can take upright lessons but all that's electric which is great you know because I'm there six seven hours a day for either one or two days a week yeah and that's kind of when I started teaching there five years ago that's how I started building my electric chops back oh, up getting because back into I was it? like I got getting back into it cuz you're playing warm ups with kids every day you're right. finding new stuff for them to work on you know yeah it's you learn so much when you teach you know cuz every yeah. student has different needs and different needs than you had when sure. you were learning you know so you got to you got to find different things for them so all the time you're learning new stuff right yeah, cuz if I got get- if I just taught every kid the shit I the stuff I sorry no, no, go the, for it. the stuff I learned when I was coming up yeah. it, it'd be, it wouldn't it wouldn't address their needs you know what right. I mean so I got to find new stuff to bring to them where I see deficiencies in their playing or you know music they need to check out so mm-hmm. that's how I started playing electric a lot more and getting my sound together and getting my chops together and getting my technique together have you been seeing like a common thread in what what the students are showing up like what the deficiencies are or where the holes in musical yeah. awareness is. I would say, I would say, man, students right now have access to so much. Yeah, but it's it's also overload. It, it can be overload, yeah. right? But I find there's no, the, there's never a lack. The, there's never a need to find stuff they're interested in. You know what that means? Right. Like, I never get a kid coming to me. And he's like, man, I, you know, I want to get into funk music, but I don't know what to listen. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's like you can always find sure. something like that. What what I see. On electric bass is like there's a real lack of really basic technique sometimes, yeah. you know, and I I don't know like most of my students are, are pretty young, so it's to be expected, but it, it's it's really amazing if you give them a couple exercises and tell them to be conscious of a few things, especially the left hand. It's like the, the you know the it's noticeable right the improvement in their playing over a few months, you know. How much is how much do you feel like the, you know, internet musician thing has shaped their mind? They coming in just wanting to play, the modern tune and show it off. Yeah, I I'm lucky because, right, I I teach a musicians institute, which is you know, largely had the rep of, of school of rock, yeah. you know, which 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 a lot of the school is. There's a bunch of kids there just for like a year and a half to get a performer certificate. I teach in the bachelor's degree department, okay. so you can actually can earn a bachelor's from MI. You take all your music classes at MI, and we've been offering some gen, gen ed classes too, or you can go to a community college to your gen eds, whatever. So my students there are a little more committed and a little more interested. Yeah. Um, and the same with Fullerton College. That's in a jazz plot, like I said, a jazz applied program. So they're they're into it. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I do. I So I never get teach me how to slap like this or check this guy. How do I do that? I never really get that, which is, which is cool. Okay. No, no, that's not to say all my students are aware of that stuff. For sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they don't, they like, don't even know. Enough have you checked this guy out? You yeah. Know, blah, blah, blah. And they're a little too eager to kind of go to YouTube and check out the guy performing the transcription. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. But I'd say more often than not, if I tell a student to transcribe something, they'll, they'll do it without cheating oh, great. too much, which cool. is good. Yeah. Which is good. And I think that's kind of like, I like to think that's the kind of like relationship I built with them. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, right, come on, I'm asking you to do this. Do it yeah. right. You know, right. and they have, you know, 
<laughs> the respect and the interest there. To sure. Yeah, and then, so sure. what are the at the where you teach the jazz program? What are those kids coming in looking for? Or like those are kids are all into like learning tunes and improvising. And who are they listening to right now? Or is there some guy like when it, I came up, all the dudes, all the '90s guys were big. So like I was listening a lot to Brecker and Patitucci mm-hmm. and Matheny. Sure. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm still on the course of going back, you mm-hmm. know, and like checking out the old stuff. Right. It wasn't till you know I think. Later in college, I started checking out Sonny Stitt right. and, like, some dudes. Yeah. Well, I think I th- the kids I teach there in Fullerton, they're all into the older stuff, which is okay. cool. I don't know if they're doing that for my benefit. Yeah. <laughs> or, but I know they're all, you know, uh, Brad Meldow, EST, yeah, yeah. you know, Sporn Spencer Trio, stuff like that. Right. The more modern stuff. Um, but they definitely all have an interest in learning jazz music, and there's, like, a you know, the the community of musicians there in that program are all Yeah, that's that's huge. Into learning the classic stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's dude, that's the most important if you ask me. Like I can I can tell a kid to do something a hundred times. Yeah. But until he's motivated by someone else, by one of his classmates or one of his peers, yep. That's it, it's gonna sink through ten times faster. Absolutely. If he's if he's around Right, because, I mean, he wants to be His able to hang. friends that are pushing yeah. him. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's all, like, that idea of, like, I want to be able to hang. Exactly. It just never leaves. It's more powerful. Than, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's easier to shut the teacher off, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but, but. No, that's the common denominator, right? That's, like, exactly. the person everybody can talk shit on out in the courtyard is the teacher. So, like, yeah, whatever <laughs> with this guy. <laughs> totally. Even though I'm paying money to go learn from him. I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but if this guy's talking about I got to check out the record, well, then I'm in. Exactly. It's funny. Exactly. It's really funny. Yeah, so it's that uh, both places are good in that regard. The, the the students are motivated to do it right. I personally love, dude. Spotify is a miracle. It's a miracle that I can reference like one of any billion of tunes available to me to be able to teach. Yeah, instantly. You know, I was talking about this the other day. It's so much music. A part of my part of my day or week growing up would be this like going to the record store and just mm-hmm. walking around yeah and like Me just too. really like checking stuff out like who's on this like i wouldn't buy a record if it didn't have the personnel listed on it i know <laughs> like yeah, of course yeah because you know then i would just go down like all right dave holland's on this one what else mm-hmm. is he on and <laughs> i don't know now i know like i i it's so because it's everywhere mm-hmm. it's just like all right I, I got some names i know some dudes i kind of uh, i'm semi aware of what's relevant right <laughs> <laughs> I like know. i don't know all the stuff that's out there yeah and it becomes so overwhelming it does i don't know it does you, I, I, sometimes i don't even know where to look like yeah. i'll go to spotify or something and be like i'll check out some new stuff i was listening to some abercrombie records oh, that nice. i haven't heard uh the other day I think that's kind of the next step in the in in this stuff is finding a way to. I I think Spotify tries to do it with like the personalized playlists and stuff. Yeah, but I think I think if there's I think there's some better way to do it for right. you to find stuff that you're interested in. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I think that's kind of the next step. Yeah, I don't. I that's almost weird. don't know. Like, if there was a master search engine, mm-hmm. you know, that would yeah. read all the platforms. Which I should really copyright that idea <laughs> I know, before right? I say it on this. Idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Who knows? But that but that would be dope. Then mm-hmm. then all everything, everything's there. Everything would come up. I mean, my son, cool. I have an eleven year old son, and he's yeah. all into like Migos and Cardi B and okay. Gucci Mane. <laughs> like I didn't. What is this music? I never knew this music existed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've only heard of Cardi. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're all like trap Ooh. rap, you know. From the south. All right. I know. It's different stuff, man. Yeah. I try not to be a square dad, though, so I'm, you know, let him listen to what he wants. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think I would be. Yeah. Because I would, at a certain point, you're just like, what? Really? This is this is what it is now? I know. This is like, uh, okay. Let's go listen to Sam Cooke. How did this get popular? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I find myself yeah. asking myself. So sure. you got you got a band. You got Black Market. I do. I've got a band, uh, Black Market Reverie, uh, that I co-lead with my good friend, Renee Miara. And um, I sing actually. Yeah, I heard I about sing this. and play bass. Yeah. So everything's it's kind of we kind of use the Ella Fitzgerald Louis Armstrong duets as a springboard. Ah, okay, okay. So everything's kind of arranged like that. Okay, everything features both of us either with harmonies or or a duet. Nice. 
and everything's got kind of she plays uke it's got kind of like an americana feel to it a bunch of originals she's also french so we do some french songs and some standards so and she I, sings in french yeah and the, we both you, do really yeah wow right. she has to teach me yeah. like syllable by syllable how to get through the two <laughs> then what do i know from french <laughs> did you have you sung and played before only doing when I sang and played backgrounds with Steve Tyrell, the the artist that I tour okay. with a sure. lot of the time, um, and that's kind of what inspired me. Because man, <laughs> so like, what are the backgrounds on his? Case? Yeah, well, that well, good right. question. Yeah. <laughs> Tyrell has a couple of duets he's recorded over okay. the years. Steve Tyrell is like he's like a Tony Bennett style standards vocalist, yeah. you know, and he like did a duet with Clark Terry. Oh, he did to do it with Frank Sinatra Jr. Okay, and then the, then he does like some Burt Bacharach tunes that have little harmonies and stuff. Yeah, not much. There's like maybe two tunes during the set. I'll do a duet tune and sing background what harmonies background on one of them. Do? Do he doesn't have duty as a bunch. He has really? a whole record. He has a whole twenty one song record that wow. just came out. Yeah, Damn. yeah, and an expanded version of a, his first back record. I think. Okay. Um, so this, after this all these Steve Wright, I, I'm, no, uh, he did. We, he was he came from music supervision for television and film. So oh. He kind of came from that. Interesting. Um, so he must just be aware of like a really exhaustive catalog of music back in the '80s and early '90s. Ah, yes, okay, you know. But anymore, he doesn't do that much stuff for for TV and film anymore. But he is hired. He's a produ- he's produces as well as sing. like he's produced Kristen Chenoweth's last record he's doing okay. the next one but I do these shows with him where I'd sing maybe two songs and I get off the stage and all these fans would come up to me and say I loved your voice which is great I'm appreciative but sure. I'm thinking to myself I sang two tunes yeah. I played bass on like 13 tunes <laughs> and the first and only thing these people <laughs> say are, to you, me, are you a little pissed like <laughs> <laughs> well you didn't like the groove I know like, I used to on? get bucked I'd be like how about the bass playing yeah. was that alright <laughs> and after a while I was like ah yeah. <laughs> can't beat them join them right. but might as well start but a band were, where i sing if they would have said the other like i love how you traded fours or something like what's up with the voice <laughs> <laughs> you would because <laughs> I, so. I would have done that Maybe like so. what's up like Maybe why can't so. you completely validate me <laughs> so then so i knew i wanted to start a project where i sung and i'm in no position to like be the front man where i just sing everything yeah. so my friend renee i'd always loved her voice and kind of loved her whole aesthetic and I wanted to do something with her, so I asked her if she wanted to start a project with me, and that's how Black Marker Reverie started. And we started just writing and arranging stuff on our own, and then we did a record at our mutual friend yeah. Chris Wabich's place. Yeah. Chris Wabich, a fantastic drummer who can like transform his house into a studio that right. really sounds good, really yeah. sounds good. And I've, uh, I've produced an EP that we did okay. with me, him, and Barsh. There you go. Uh, was the band. And I've just done like things over there. Like that'll just be a day. Like go I know, you just go and yeah. yeah. And when we went there, we just wanted to get four or five tunes done, just to see how the arrangements sound and try to get some gigs. Yeah. But by the time we were done, it sounded so good. We're like, man, let's just release it. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. It's so cheap to release something these days. Yeah. And so it really kind of took off after that. And in addition to Chris playing drums and percussion, our good friend Matt Yeakley plays uh, guitar and great violinist uh, Luis Mascaro plays plays violin so i wanted to get guys like i'd say maybe half of our rep right now is standards Mm -hmm. which is enough i I, we eventually want to do mostly originals but i wanted to get guys that don't sound you know that were gonna play and sound like themselves and so like oh it's time to play a solo right behind a a singer on an arrangement you know what i mean it's like as much as i love standards and as much as i love playing that stuff it is so easy to phone it in. You know what I mean? And just do arrangement by numbers. Sure. On that stuff. I wanted to stay away from that. So I got yeah. guys with, with strong Their voices on their instrument, like Matt and Chris, you know. So right. Really, really happy with the way the record turned out. Cool. I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. And at the, a month or two after we recorded that, I recorded an entire jazz trio record. With those two? No. Oh. With uh, Aaron McClendon and Andy Langham. And dude, this thing, I cannot that, wait that, to release it. Oh man, I didn't even know about that. I know, nobody has because I tell you because that's gonna I, be ridiculous. I was always planning on releasing that, but I wasn't planning on releasing the Black Market Reverie scene. <clears throat> and after I released it, it like gave a lot of momentum. It got played on K Jazz here in town. It's like okay. we started doing gigs. It's like 
I don't want to compete with myself. I can't <laughs> I can't release the trio record yet. So so the trio record you. is coming out this spring. Okay. It's, it's just finishing up getting mixed. But I had to put it on the back burner, you know. Where'd you, I, where'd you track that at? I tracked right here at Big City Recording. Okay. You, you ever heard of it? I've heard of it. I haven't, I haven't done it. This drummer, this Paul Taverner, it's his yeah. studio. And it's literally on the other side of Balboa from where I live. Right, like, right. Dan just, Snell connected me with that dude years ago. Yes. Because I think Josh Nelson did it. Josh right there. loves the piano there. Loves yeah, recording yeah. there. Paul's a great guy, and it's, it's really cool. But that record I'm stoked about. It's all originals. There's two. There's a Herbie tune and a McCoy tune and everything else is originals. And it's been so long, I was thinking, man, I might want to go back and just record a couple more things before I release it. But we'll, we'll see. Who's uh, – you're writing on that? Yeah, it's all, it's all my originals. Okay. Plus uh, Drift In by Herbie. Yeah, and yeah. And this tune called Festival in Bahia by uh, McCoy Tyner. Okay, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's cool. It's Andy, Andy's – he's Andy one of those Lang dudes, monster. man. Yeah, and he's one of those dudes like – Maybe every year and a half or two years, we'll end up on a gig together. Yeah. And it's like, cool. Same old. Same <laughs> yeah. old Andy. You know? Yeah, totally. Uh, but other than that, you know, yeah, I kind of forget about him. I just don't see him around. He's, I know he's, he's on the road with Poncho Sanchez. He's on the road right. with Jane Monheit. And, and oh, addition. I didn't know he was doing that. Yeah, he does. Like He's like her West Coast guy. Because you know? ah, so. I remember when Politano was doing some of those dates. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was about a year and a half ago. Mm. The first time the Dodgers. He's a busy were. dude. I'm playing with him tomorrow night just at the Gardenia with the singer. Oh, that place. Down yeah. There. <laughs> I've never been there. Like, it's I, cool. I, I no, I have been there. I've never. No, I played there. Yeah, it's. It's kind of like this Manhattan esque <coughs> cabaret club. Yeah, super in small. In West Hollywood, yeah. Yeah. Super small. It gives off that, that midtown Broadway restaurant kind of vibe you know, <laughs> with the cabaret singers. Yeah. But, yeah. Who's the singer on that? Her name's Marianne Real. You know, she no. I think that's you know, she just goes there every couple of months and does a show. You know what I mean? She's not like a. So how you been releasing these records? Like how dealing with the music business of releasing a record? Are you great question? Digital distribution only. Do you have hard copies? Did you go vinyl? I didn't. I so we did digital. We went through DistroKid. Did. Digital distribution that way. Okay. And then I found a place close to here that Chris Wabich hooked me up actually with, with um, that does uh, limited run pressings. So I could do a hundred CDs for three hundred bucks. Really? And so back in the day, you'd always have to do a thousand CDs for a thousand bucks or whatever. Yeah, twelve hundred yeah. from disc makers. You know, that's yeah, the minimum like five hundred. And then you have piles of CDs yeah. everywhere, especially now. So yeah, so I did a hundred. I think it was like came to three twenty five total. Okay. Sold out of those. Had to go back and print up more. That's right. And now I only have like nine CDs left for our show. This <laughs> Sunday, so maybe I'll have to print up more. Makes me think, ah, maybe I should have given myself more credit and printed up four or five hundred. But yeah, but no big deal. We all know the guys that just like they want to do a record and then it just turns into a box in the closet. Exactly. From twenty years ago when exactly. they did a record. And it's not like you're gonna make a bunch of money selling CDs. So might as well just like pin up here and there when you need but to. The, but they move. People are still buying them at the show. People shows. are still buying them, especially, you know, I mean, a lot of people who like our music know me through Steve Tyrell or, or, or fans of vocal standards and stuff. They're a little older. Let's be honest. Okay. Not a lot of 20 year olds right. <laughs> yet coming out right. of the shows. Uh, so those are the those. That's the crowd that likes to buy CDs. Right. Still, right, right. You so know. They're still, they're still yeah. there. So I think I'll do the same thing with the trio record, you know, go digital and then just print up a hundred CDs. Yeah. See what happens. Have you done the Spotify thing? And I'll put them on. Sure. There? Yeah. Sure. Got the whole artist profile and you, you like placing them on specific playlists. I know that's a thing of that. Like you got to get listens before you do that. Really? Yeah. There's a whole system. They have this tutorial, but I don't know how the algorithm. I don't know really if works. you can pay to do it, but the I, more I think listens you can, I think you can like subscribe. You Maybe can so. submit to a specific playlist, but some of them you have to buy on to. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I got it. I remember they sent me like a little video tutorial that I haven't watched really yet. on how to get on that stuff. Yeah, I probably should. The, that part of the that part of the game's its own hustle, man. Totally. Oh, it's totally. daunting. I know, and it's like I think about just think about like how long have you had your Instagram? How long have we been hip to iTunes? And it's right. like we never really thought of it. I was like, oh, this is going to be the shit in the future. Right. Meanwhile, there's all these kids coming up. Yeah. You know, now they have like five, 6,000 followers and they're yeah, streaming right. and like their YouTube's blowing up and they're monetizing off YouTube and stuff. It's like, man, I was in all those stuff on the ground level. I didn't even <laughs> right. think about any of this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't see that. 
Man, yeah, I remember when the iPod came out. And I'm like, oh, wow. I know. Well, that's <laughs> right? cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's just kind of a cool gadget. Yeah. Next thing you know. Next thing you know. <laughs> yeah, it's this. I'm pretty crazy. Man. So going backwards and like trying to, you know, start an Instagram profile, try to get followers and promoted ads. And ugh, it's just, you yeah, know, it's a, I mean, it's, it's so much easier to get your music distributed and that I'm thankful for, but it's like the same old thing. But driving traffic the there. Day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Getting ears on it, getting people to to listen to your stuff is, is still very hard. Right. Have you, what, uh, have you found a system that's kind of worked? I mean, you're selling out of CDs. So Not really. Are, yeah, I mean, that's because that, I'll tell you what, most of that comes from Ch- K-Jazz plays. Oh, yeah. That's and great. I just sell my, um, I sell the CD on Bandcamp. Okay. And people will go and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll find, they'll find our band camp. We just go. There's a link on our website too, blackmarkerreverie.com. Yeah. Um, I'll release one. So that's this. cool. And then, you know, just shows, you know, I saw a couple of the, the shows here and there too. Yeah. I haven't really given a lot out for promo. Really? Yeah. You just, I mean, for, you just email someone and send them a Dropbox yeah, folder, yeah. you know, along with your EPK. So that's cool. Yeah. What's, um. So Tyrell, you mm-hmm. talked about him twice. You started with him in '01. Yeah, I mean, you got here in LA though. in 2000. So I how did. quick? I remember my first year in LA sucked. Yeah, dude, I just st- stumbled into that. I'll tell you what it was. So when I got to LA, for whatever reason, there wasn't a lot of um, jazz bass players at USC. Okay. So the Thelonious Monk Institute used to have a jam session at the spot in Los Feliz, and I'd go every week. What spot? It was called the Jazz Spot. It's oh. not there anymore. No. They've all been closing. Now. I know, right? Since I got to L.A., like, <laughs> all of them, just Spazio, Lavalie. I know. Charlie O's. They just dropped, like, flies all within, like, a year and a half. Yeah. So, so I did, then the like, USC kids started asking me to do gigs, and I even played on recitals and stuff like that. So that's how I first started getting to know people. Okay. And then, um, it's funny, this drummer, Rob Perkins, actually. Oh, yeah. Was like, hey, I know this guy, Steve Tyrell. He's getting, he's auditioning people to be in his band. Come tomorrow night and do it. And I'm, yeah, and I just, I just got it. I just like, Killed. I don't know why. I just like totally stumbled into was it. Was Perkins yeah. playing with Buble then? Not yet. No. Okay. That was actually two years later. Right. You did so, a run with Buble. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did almost a year with Buble. Okay. And then, but that was the drummer Bill Wysaski. Okay. And then after we left the gig, pretty much around the same time, and then Rob started doing it. Got it. So, yeah, and I've been, man, I've been off, on and off again with Steve ever since then. That's and it's good. cool because he's, he, he's good and he's got a nice career, but he's not gone. Yeah. He's not out for a month or two at sure. a time, you know. It's like tops a week, week and a half, but what, mostly like weekend trips. What which kind is of good gigs are you doing? Like Supper Club? Yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff. Theaters, smaller sure. theaters. We okay. just got done doing Catalina's nice. last week. And then the week, we did five nights there. And then the week before, we did three nights at... Uh, Sergerstrom Performing Arts Center in Orange County. Okay. They have a smaller, like, cabaret-ish kind of room. Yeah. You know? And then in a f- uh, couple weeks, we're going to um, San Francisco doing Feinstein's at the Nico for three days. Okay. A little cabaret club. Four days, I guess. McCollum Theater in Palm Spring. That's a one-off. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So balancing road life and teaching life. Tough, man. Yeah? Not easy. So am I, since at Musicians Institute, since they're on quarters, you only have, like, your 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 semester is only twelve weeks long, yeah. so they don't want you missing more than three, okay. which is understandable, and they don't want you missing finals weeks and you yeah. know so, and it's such a big place with so many so many instructors there. It's like you got to toe the company line, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's it's hard to get special treatment, but I've kind of learned like what I need to do, like. The good thing about having quarters like that is like this for this quarter, I knew I was going to be busy. So I just I just cut down my availability to one day and I'm only okay. there one day a week where I was there two or three days in the past, you know. So that's how I manage that. Fullerton College is a little easier because I just do base lessons uh, as adjunct faculty. And, you know, they're just as long as you get 14 lessons in the semester, however you want to do it. Yeah, you know, okay. We don't care. So it's it's a little looser there. Which sure, is but good. then you got to be there for juries and stuff. Well, yeah, I do juries and stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely. So the, I mean, that's got to fall. When does when does school end there? When does this with the spring semester end there? Because that that seems like it would be 
May. Around the same time where Tyrell might want to do start doing some summer runs. Yeah, that's the funny thing about Tyrell is he doesn't have a big summer thing. Really? Yeah, his busy time of the year is the first part of the year. Really? Yeah, he was with he was with this agent for a while that got him on jazz festivals and stuff, but he didn't really dig it. So he never got in the festival thing. You okay. know what I mean? So it's like uh, the summers were usually pretty quiet. Great. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. You know. But so then you're off from school and the road. Exactly. So then you're just exactly. looking. Well, for not from MI. Like the MI is pretty much year round. That's true. That's but true. It, it, you know, it's good to be off with my son. Yeah, is yeah, off of course. Too, you know, my wife is a is a middle school guidance counselor, so she's off summers as well. I didn't actually know that. I yeah. met her, but I've never. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's her gig. So they're both off summers, so that's good. that's cool. Yeah, and get some so. get some time. Definitely. How did so teaching, mm-hmm. personal practice. The road mm-hmm. and family. Let's look yeah. that balance. Man, it you know, you gotta be flexible and just know that a couple weeks, okay, I'm gonna be on the road for a couple weeks. Yeah. I gotta just maintain the other stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I gotta maintain the family yeah. so everyone's not mad. I gotta maintain my whatever practice I can get in so sure. I don't start sucking. Uh, so you just got you just gotta be flexible with it, you know, and then commit more time. When you can, yeah, you know, it's a family and practicing. I found that personal practice these days really just means preparing for gigs and, you know, getting in some technique shedding whenever I can. But I'm lucky because I teach. So I'm doing, like I said, I'm doing warm ups all days. Right. You got a bass in your hands. I have a bass in my hand and I'm really big on playing along with my students, too. So I'm doing the warm ups along with them. Okay. And the technical exercises and stuff. So I find that that really helps maintain. My technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, what? That's good. There's nothing specifically you're working on, or is it a lot of just the writing and arranging for mm, Black I'd Market? say, uh, as far as bass stuff, I have this little arpeggio exercise I teach to all my students that I'm I'm constantly playing because is I have them up? play it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. like a... Just real simple. Go up the the seven arpeggios down the scale. Then a couple octaves. Really basic. Different different scales. Different modes. Nice. And then there's like a couple exercises I do on the upright bass just to kind of, you know, like maintain and make sure. Sure. You know scales and you know the vomit exercise. I don't know if you know that one. Which one's that? It's also called the shifting exercise. So where you start. What's yeah? Yeah. yeah. Like, do, uh, da, oh, do, yeah. Eh, de, oh, do. I go up the scale, coming back to the root the whole time with sure. the bow. It's it's really gnarly. It's like I've played through different uh, versions of that. You mm-hmm. know, sometimes they're just like straight to the octave. Yeah. Like all the way up and back to yep. to get to get over the bout and into thumb and all that. It's, stuff. it's like jogging. It's like you know, it's right. like aerobics for bass. Yeah. It's good to keep up with that. Right, stuff. What's the equivalent of like just complaining about my back? <laughs> Like, what's the bass player equivalent of this? Like, ah, my knee's out. I like, like, I don't want to go really, run in the park. I can't really do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm too, so old that. I'm too old for that. I'm too old for this warming up shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but i tell you what was really important as far as, like, maintaining all these different parts of my life was I find when I'm on the road so much and teaching so much that, like, when it comes time to hit with some cats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My ears are a little behind. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like if you're not if you're not playing fast tempos and stuff, that stuff's a little behind. So it's like that's why uh, I love doing the falls for as long as I did it, yeah, which was yeah. a jam session, big L.A. hang that Ryan, so many cats are a part of. It's still happening every Monday. But it's like changed. I do it just because it's like that's another form of practice for me. Yeah. Calling tunes, staying on your toes, playing with different people, you know, hitting with some serious guys. Yeah, and that one – when uh, so that was run by Matt Yakely, the dude who's in mm-hmm. Black Market, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and when he was bringing in a lot of his originals, like that was a yeah, that was a course in like sight reading in five, totally, or, totally. or whatever. Like he he was writing a lot of odd meter stuff because <laughs> he wouldn't care what your mood was. He'd throw some like yeah. fifteen in front of you, and like, right, right. Because he's not this. He's like, no, nah, let's play it. Yeah, because like, he's right. always for some reason <laughs> in a good mood, <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't care about if you're in a bad mood. That's true. So he, he don't care if you're not in the mood to read in five. No, you're gonna no because do this it. is what's happening. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, that's good for you. And that, yeah. that reading is a chop that you have to you have to shed that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's good. So I, you know, I found that since uh, Matt Matt's still doing it at times, he he he'll farm it out to different guys to to host other times. Right. I haven't been able to make it the few times he's called me the past couple months. But I found that's something I need to start addressing. Whether it's just like 
having guys come over to play and doing a shed session or or going out to jams or something like that. Right. You know, that's that's one one part of my playing. I need to. Yeah, I like doing that. On. I like the like to just get together, checking in with people you haven't seen. But like musicians, you know, it's going to be cool. The problem with the right. jam session is just like. <laughs> unless it's the house band totally unless it's the, you're just uh, totally you never exactly. know who you never know who you're gonna it's a lottery yeah you never know what you're gonna end up with and that could go either way like you know i mean i've been out there and it'd be like amac rustler and kamasi mm-hmm. and the band was on fire <laughs> mm-hmm. but then there's other times it wasn't that it was band. like who are you guys yeah yeah totally but it, <clears throat> that being said uh it's cool that, that the younger guys still come out and they're still involved because you that's the way to do it. Definitely. You know, so Definitely. like I've been doing it a long time, so maybe I'm not interested mm-hmm. sometimes, mm-hmm. but good for them. Yeah. You know, like they, they, they have it to get out there and, you know, put it on the line in front of older people and exactly. dudes who've been on the scene longer. I think that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, Dude, didn't I think the scene now is the strongest it's ever been. I've yeah? been in L.A. for 19 years. It'll be 19 years in July. I think this the thing is so much it's, more happening. It's an interesting shift, right? So many totally. like the all the whole piano bar click, they're all jazz stars now. I know. Right? Like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> which totally. is hilarious to me. Totally. And then you have then you have acts like Noah and Thundercat. Yeah, yeah. Not really jazz. No. But it's all part on of the that same thing. scene though. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And like And they're all the same dudes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. A lot of the same musicians. Uh so and that's you know, that's those acts are huge now and yeah. well deserved. You know, they I should be. So. so and then you have a lot of a lot of New York musicians moving to LA mm-hmm. because there's come on, it's better. Yeah. <laughs> like just as far as living your life. Sure. You know. Um I so, haven't spent enough time in New York to really Yeah. Oh, I to have. mention that I mean it's always been cool every time I've been out there. Mm-hmm. But I was this, like, the, dude, the a couple scene names and the musicianship at a time. there is great, but it's yeah. just like Walking across town, you, you spent 50 bucks. You don't even know how. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Riding the subway is like 4 or $5. It's crazy. Time there? Yeah, with Tyrell, we've done really long residencies in New York. At First at um, Feinstein's at the Regency Hotel and then the Carlisle. So I'd be there for four to six weeks at a time. Okay. And I probably, I probably did that eight or nine times. Going back, actually, in April. Doing okay. Two weeks in April. First time I've... I will have been there for s- such a long time in years. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. You get to like go out after your gig and see what's uh-huh. up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the cool thing about New York is it, it's a late town. Yeah. All the gigs are done by 12, 1230 here in LA. But right. Not New York, man. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe one, mm-hmm. but that's, that's the latest it's going to go here. Yeah. But that's fine yeah. because that last hour is just barely hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> like no one's, <laughs> no one's out to like hang. Totally. That like. Totally. That's true, man. Uh, are you doing a record release with the trio record? Yeah, I need to. That's, that's actually the next step. I told myself like, I'm not going to finish it unless I give myself a deadline. So mm. I'm going to call and get a gig at the tellers or something like yeah. that and be like, okay, now it's for real. Now I have to finish it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Because it's like I don't want to put anything else on my plate <laughs> right now. Right. It's like I feel that way when I'm when I'm feeling overwhelmed. But it's like, this, you know, I got to get this music out there. It's I haven't done. been back. So it was Sheila's uh, – it was the E-Spot. Oh, it was the E-Spot for a while. Yeah, and now it's just the tellers. That's yeah, cool. And it's got they got cool people running it. And the can they have a bass amp again? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, you can have a whole band again. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, there was something funny that happened there where someone in the neighborhood was suing them, so right. they didn't allow amps on stage. And it was – it was there's something very odd about yeah, that Yeah, which doesn't thing. make sense because it's always been – yeah, they've always had music like that didn't change. Yeah, I don't, new I, ownership happened. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what precisely happened, but it's cool now. Okay. Black Market, we did our uh, uh, CD release show there. Oh, sorry. Last year, last May. And it was great. Yeah, loved it. Are you trying to get in on like the festival scene with that? Would love to. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I mean, any any of Steve's guys? Uh, mm, I no. don't know. Maybe I. You know, he's been really cool. Steve is the he's he's a DJ at K Jazz. He's yeah, I've heard played my show. stuff. I I don't want to like abuse his generosity, so I try not to ask too much because he's been so cool so far. So yeah, but, you know. Yeah, maybe I'll ask around. I you know I, I, I you can always like spend a bunch of dough on a publicist, but yeah. You could. <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. It's like, like, you never really know, like, how much they're really doing, you know? And it seems like to me, check this out, like, I'm not trying to <laughs> belittle anyone's thing, but, yeah. like, whatever you get with this publisher, oh, 
we're number one on on Jazz Times Weekly. And the right. other person's like, oh, we're number one on jazzforever.com. The other yeah, guy's yeah. like, oh, we're number one. You know, it's like there's all these different charts and right. and sites and stuff. It's like, what is yeah, like what's, actually, what does that actually mean? You know what I mean? Right, and like, what does what does that do? Like, yeah, yeah exactly. No one's downloaded the record. Like, I can check the analytics. Like, no, one's, <laughs> <laughs> no, no one's even listening like, to the what's thing. What's that actually I, doing for it? It's right. almost like there's this whole like uh, PR thing where it's like, you know, we'll set up this website and get your guys on this, and we'll set up right. this list and get your guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, it's, it's a conspiracy theory, but yeah, yeah, I don't know how that. The whole publicist game is really weird. Well, yeah. the whole just like I don't know the online numbers thing happened when that was it some video that went it got really popular I don't know if it went viral mm-hmm. where it shows like the the secret warehouse or something of Instagram and all the the phones that are just on have you seen this no yeah I got shown this uh, a friend of mine showed it to me on a gig like maybe a month ago but when you like buy followers and stuff it's like all these phones wow you're kidding no, me just like hooked up that are going. And see, I, that that's even out. that's actually more that's deeper than I thought it was. I thought they would just assign you numbers. Like I didn't know it was actually tied to actual phones. Yeah, I didn't know it was tied Dude, to accounts. Crazy. I thought it was just like, all right, you gave us so much money here. Here's this number <laughs> on a screen. I thought that's it was that crazy. kind of racket. Yeah. Turns out it's actual phones, but they're just they're all. Uh, I don't. Know, I don't want to talk <laughs> as if I actually know. I didn't. I didn't see the whole thing. That's still crazy though. That's still crazy. <clears throat> it's just a racket. Yeah. I feel, oh, I know it's too much to keep up with, and like, what am I giving you the money for? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I don't know, man. I figure we'll just keep playing, work on the music, and you know, see yeah. what happens. You, you Look doing, for opportunity where you can find it. Doing any gigs uh, outside of LA with that group? You doing any like San Diego, Phoenix, anything? No, nothing yet. I, I, it's like, man, I've done so many like bars and hotel lobbies, and it's. I just want to do shows yeah. with this band. Renee no. too, because she does. You know, she does a lot of. She lives out in Thousand Oaks. She does a lot of stuff out there. It's like, I just want to. You know, I want people yeah. come listen. You know, I want to be. Yeah. I want to like kind of start on a on a different right. level. You know what right. I mean? Like we played Seven Grand, and it's cool, and I love playing Seven Grand. Yeah, but yeah. you know, it's loud, and you got to do three sets, and it's not. It's not really like a show. You know? No, what I mean? no, no. That's that's like a house party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which like people will listen. If they can dance. <laughs> the, Otherwise, they'll exactly. go to the patio. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That no, I life. feel the same way. I, so much of that thing, I just got, got a little burnt on. Mm-hmm. Last night, uh, Paul Atano and I were doing a duo gig. Nice. And like halfway through the first tune, yeah, guys, it sounds great. Can you just can you just turn down? I know. It's like, <laughs> what? It's, it's like, an what acoustic piano. Like, no one's being mic'd here. Like, what's... Dude, I just... I was got done doing a... I did an event for a jazz organization two weeks ago. <laughs> and I say, turn down. I'm like, are you guys supporting jazz musicians? Or what? Turn down. Like, and it's like, does anyone really complain to these people that it's too loud or they're just like, you know what I mean? Right. They're just trying to be like in charge of the situation. Yeah, yeah. I think there's probably <laughs> some of that. Uh, <laughs> and also like, oh, now there's music? No. This, this changed. <laughs> yeah. This just changed exactly. the dynamic somehow. Exactly. In the what room? if people want to talk? Right. Better quiet these guys down. Uh, yeah. So yeah, th- that that sure. gets old. Uh, but a great place to learn. Great place to like gigs like that, playing with people, playing mm-hmm. tunes, and just some like uh, real life working musician things. Definitely. It just gets old. Yeah. Uh, for me, it did. Uh, there's guys out there that are cool. Right. You know, that they just do it. And they that's, do it. And they can still play. You know what, man? That's why I dig teaching because it's like when it, I, I never taught. Like all the way from when I moved to LA to when I started working in my five years ago. And it's like, I started teaching it. I liked the experience of teaching. And it's like, hey, now I don't have to drive to Orange County for a hundred bucks. You know what right. I mean? It's like, you know, just a little, the afford you the opportunity to say no a little more. Kind right. Of craft what you want to do. Yeah. In, into, 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 you know, the, the musical experience that you want. So with the Americana influence, mm-hmm. what uh, where are you coming from in that? I really like bands like the Avet Brothers and Lake Street Dive. This kind of like I, I guess you'd call it indie folk, um, and that's always kind of been part of what I listen to. Being from Indiana, yeah, like all the kind of indie rock in in Indiana 
or the or the local musician scene, I should say more specifically, is that kind of thing. Like Wilco is really big out there. Okay, and and just that kind of you know indie Americana kind of stuff. Yeah, I really like all the songwriting in that genre. Okay, even some like al- alternative country stuff. I really dig. Yeah. You know that new Casey Musgraves album. I think is great. I haven't heard that. There's a uh, the Punch Brothers. I love just different bands like this. So I was just thinking if I wanted to. S- Start a band where I sung some standards, which I did. I I needed an angle because I just couldn't do the the the, the piano trio, you know, right. fly me to the moon thing. It's just like, <laughs> you know, God bless the people that do it. I'm not saying it's like I couldn't do that anymore. I've done it enough playing behind other people, right? And that seemed like a really natural kind of influence. And when I talked to Renee about it, she was like right in line, and she Perfect. played me like a couple originals of hers that really kind of crafted the sound of the band really and then had you worked with her prior to this band? yeah she used to have a, a a jazz brunch gig at uh the four seasons out there in in agora hills Thousand yeah, yeah, somewhere out there. Nice. yeah yeah so they have, like, that's that old pre- truck by the bar like what is that is you know what i'm talking about there's like I, this is so lame to say on the mic because i'm gonna try to describe a room that's in one you walk in you hang a left and then there's like uh, opening there's like this little trolley truck is there yeah like the 1920s i always went like down the back like oh. around the restaurant so i don't think i ever saw the yeah I, I probably got <laughs> like what these are the instructions <laughs> no i'm belling <laughs> like i'm not doing that it's too much then i gotta move my car no <laughs> no totally i'll tip this guy to do it for me yeah but i played with her there a lot and we really hit it off and she got other gigs and and we'd play and but then kind of you know, lost opportunities to play with each other as much when she wasn't doing that gig anymore. So right. That's why I thought of her when I wanted to start at this group. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> what, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have another. <laughs> I don't have a follow up question. <laughs> follow up question. Yeah. What's next? Yeah, what do you got I, coming up? Well, I'm recently the trio record. I, I recently got promoted to Steve Tyrell's MD. So I'm really uh, busy. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm busy with his stuff. Not only touring, but like getting the music together and, you know. But that, it's been the same stuff. cats for a while. So yeah. So it's not. You There's been to, some turnover lately. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Was that your doing? Not my. No. You no, go in there and just like. Here's no. the thing. Here's the like Steve Tyrell. Like I said, he's a producer, so he's pretty much. You know, he's always got. Yeah. <laughs> he always, he's executive MD. He's yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's just the the small stuff. Like I said, getting books together and getting up, make sure all the, the PDFs are right. And okay. Helping with set lists and trying to get to together rehearsals, just stuff like that. But <laughs> he yeah. always has the last say in everything. Yeah. Well, that's cool though. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, it's be- it's almost better that way. Right. Uh, so I'm busy with his stuff and he'll he's fairly busy until May. Then um then our homie Matt is getting married. Yeah. And uh having That's a right. bachelor party you going to in that? New Orleans. I think here's the crazy thing. I'm the best man in our keyboard player John Allen's wedding and <laughs> and his bachelor party is the week before in Vegas. Okay. So if I do a bachelor party in Vegas, a couple of days off, bachelor party in New Orleans, like I got, I got to pace myself. <laughs> I mean, I can't. That's dude. That's a recipe for so much debauchery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I gotta. Yeah. I know it's coming up, and I mean, I'm assuming you're on the same email. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Of course um, yes. And I keep like, yeah, I'll check it out later. <laughs> I got all this stuff to do right now. I'll check it out later. Uh, we're and, in but I, Mac. We're talking the other day. We're I know it's going to creep up, though. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> that's happening next week. I better right. get this together. Oh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And, the, you know, releasing the trio record and, you know, keeping, you know, keep juggling everything, the teaching, <laughs> the touring, my own right. projects, gigs in town. Well, how do you go about booking? Do you book a black market? I've been lucky. I, I have a little bit, but I've been lucky. I've been approached by a few Via, via like awareness through KJ's. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. killing or or other shows that we've done. Okay, you know, I've been approached from other people, but um, yeah, I, I do the booking too. I want to go back to Indiana where I grew up and do a CD release yeah, show there this summer. So I think that's kind of where's she from? For me. She's from here. She's from the valley, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> killing. How do you go about booking? Oh, like, I've done I, it. I wish, man. I wish I could. I wish I had a good answer for you. I've I've done it, but it's then, like we're bass players, man. It's like we're used to people calling us. You know what I mean? <laughs> until like I had to up my game because right around the time I got to LA, there was a lot of bass players booking. Mm, so then, yeah. I there's gigs I would ne- obviously never do. Mm-hmm. So then I had to mm-hmm. go create other opportunities, and I think there it became kind of. Um, it fed off of itself in that way. Mm-hmm. 
And then I I got so burnt out on that I didn't want to. Right. I get burnt out easy. I just try. (laughs) Like (laughs) I don't deal with stress well, and I'm like, screw this, I'm done. I'm off to something else. I mean, honestly, I just try to make sure I have like video and and press kit stuff that's all in line, and just like send it out. But I'm 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 just learning how to do the hustle. I'm still not very good at it. You know. You know, I look like guys like you think about guys like Nick Mancini, like Mm -hmm. tremendous musician. Yeah. Vibes player, right? Yeah. Is you, you got you got to create your own work playing right. an instrument like vibraphone. It's just everyone needs a bass player, not everyone needs a vibraphone. Right. You know, everybody it's, needs Nick though. Everyone, yeah, needs, yeah everybody yeah, needs Nick. Nick is an he's exceptional amazing. musician yeah. and a great uh, hang. Like one yeah. of my all time favorite people. He's great. Yeah, but his hustle is great, man. You know, yeah. he's like he he really he gets cool gigs and he has different projects and you know yeah. Stand Chris to learn is something like that from too. Like, yeah, Chris no, always Chris has a. Uh, Ten projects going. I know, right? Knowledge. You're just talking with him about Cassie. Oh, we have a band together. Oh, yeah, yeah we have. A, oh, we're doing this together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's good, though, man. It's like it's that's great. We want. We need that. We need different creative output like that. Yeah, and there's so many people doing so many things right now. Mm-hmm. It's hard to check it all out. Like, for sure. I don't. I haven't heard. Like, I haven't wor- heard Will's trio. Will Brom. I haven't heard his. Trio. Oh yeah, I've only yeah <laughs> I only have I played with Will a bunch recently, but I've only heard his trio. I haven't um, played with him in a while. He sounds great. Man. He sounds. Man, he did a gig at the Mint uh, on the Monday night jam session thing. Was that with Amac with, and Kerry? No, it was with me and uh, uh, Mike Raganese. Oh yeah, and Sean Balthazar on drums. Oh yeah, I love Sean. It's bad I love dude, Sean. Dude, dude, it was a fun hit, man. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. Yeah, Sean. Sean has a great concept. Like yeah, he just man. he's always thinking long arc, <laughs> like all the time. But he's super in the moment and yeah, super. He's a bad uh, dude. Yeah, there's so many good musicians in town right now, man. Very inspiring. Yeah, it, the um, that's one thing that like really keeps me in L. A. Is mm-hmm. like the level of musicianship. Totally. Totally. Uh, during my little fit, in back in January, me. <laughs> Me and Dennis Ham, I called him like, dude, I just need some perspective. Like, let's go get dinner. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that, that's a, I'm like, dude, I'm still here because of the musicians. Like, mm-hmm. I can't. It's yeah. it's pretty ridiculous when I just look through my phone and be like, okay, totally. These dudes are all the dudes. Totally. I mean, you think about it, man. It'd be easy to try to find some university gig and move to a different place where it's cheaper to live and bigger house and blah blah blah. But it's like, dude, yeah just trying to scrape together musicians to play with in the middle of the Midwest, dude, it would drive me nuts. It yeah. would drive me crazy. Right. You know, not to be pushed and inspired by the other musicians who are your peers. You sure. Know? Yeah. There's so much of that. That's what's totally. happened for me. We'll be in here. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. It's been, what was the scene like in, in Michigan? Cause you came here from Michigan. Michigan was good. It was, it was, it was, the scene was, yeah. I came here from Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I did my master's degree. And they had a great, a very strong jazz program. So, but the scene was mostly students or people who had recently graduated, and which was split. great because there are a lot of good musicians, but you know, nothing like L.A. Right, and right. The, and the, the gigs out there were like whatever, local breweries and restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, you yeah. Know, nothing but too nothing. heavy hitting. Okay, and like older guys wouldn't stick around; they graduate. And Not just really. New yeah, York they, or they, LA or yeah, they, else. a lot of them moved to Chicago because of our proximity to Chicago. Okay, but there's a lot of musicians here that. Went to Western Michigan University with me. You know Joe Ayub? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Went Him, to school Farkas, together. Um, Brett Farkas, Jed Jenna, Hunter. Yeah, they all came out together. All those guys. Yeah. They, yeah. they all came out because of Lyman, by the way. Uh, really? Yeah. They I all they were doing their undergrad while, uh, while I did my grad school, and then I moved to L.A. And then Joe and Brett like tran- planned a little trip out here. They came out and stayed with friends, and they come and hung with me. And I'd already started touring with Tyrell okay. at this point. They were like, Whoa, how'd you get that? And I was just telling about my gigs and who, how I've been meeting people and stuff. And next thing you know, they're both out here like doing gigs 10 times as big as mine. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's AU about with now? AU, but he's been doing, um, He's been doing Enrique forever. I think he's still doing Enrique Iglesias. Yeah, he was. I remember him doing that. I think Eric Curtis was doing that for a minute. Well, he was. Joe was trying to juggle Enrique and Shakira right. at the same time for a while. Yeah, yeah. And I think. I think. I think Enrique, you know, made him an well, offer he couldn't refuse. Shakira, right, well, and Shakira was on like, The Voice or something. Like she, oh yeah, and I might have had a kid. I, like, call I, think dude, I haven't talked to him. Yeah, in a me while. neither. I always run into him in super weird places, mm-hmm. and it's like nothing ever changed. Yeah, but at the same time, we haven't hung enough yeah. for there to be like the old days. Either. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old days that never were. Yeah, exactly. That's Joe A. <laughs> but he's amazing. I used to teach at the same place with Brett. That's how I met him. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, Brett, I still see. Brett's and Jevin right. teaches it in my, so I see him around. School. Okay, okay. I played with him not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they had that band population game. Yeah, they were great, man. Slamming. The band's so good with I Justin was, Avery. Yes, I love that band. Guy from yeah, all those guys. They moved out as a band. Right, right. Smart thing to do. Yeah, but they're all brilliant in their own right. Mm-hmm. Like it. Uh, I Definitely. wish that band would have went. Yeah. Had more well, Justin got the gig with Meatloaf. You know, had to move away. Right, right. I remember that. Or, uh, or spend most of his time away from L.A. I should say. I don't know if he ever. Is that is that what happened with the band? Yeah, I think so. I mean, they'll you know, Joe's on the road with these pop stars, and I know I know Justin. If he's not still doing it, he was for a while singing backgrounds with Meatloaf, and Meatloaf like brings all his band out and just like rehearses for two months before he does oh, a gig, really? you know, okay. and everyone like lives on his compound or something like that. Wow. Or it's something like that. This is all he said. She said stuff. But yeah, yeah. Something like that happens. So <laughs> I think it's hard for them to schedule gigs anymore, you know? Right. Right. You're going to send me all the links. I'll release it with this stuff. So yeah, I mean, definitely. You want to release the trio record? You wanna, yeah. You want me to put links to it? Is that, are you going to? I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to blackmarketreverie.com and I'll have links to everything. Everything will be there? Yeah. Is that going to be like the landing spot for? No, I'm, I'm either going to start I, I, my own homepage or a, or a band camp page that kind of en- encompasses everything. But for right now, that's a good way to, that's a good way you can. Email me all the emails. I, mean, I there just got hip to these uh, pages. I'm, I suck at retaining information. <laughs> it's like one page, and all it is is just like links to everything else. Oh, that's a that's good idea. It. Like, there's no like, there's a banner image, and then just like links to everything. Um, I'll find out what that is. I'll remember. Oh, my Instagram's is. good at Big Funky One. Yeah, Big the funky. number one. Was there was Big Funky already taken? So you had to. Yeah, do, so really? I did, I'm Big Funky on Twitter. Like I got right, in the Twitter game. <laughs> early, early, but by the time I got to Instagram, there's already a big. So funky. Now, this is big okay, funky, so the Instagram one. big funky. Did mm-hmm. he hit you up on Twitter and like, dude, what's up? Is there like a no, big funky rivalry? No, but a couple times people have tagged me as big funky in their stuff. It, but it, oh, the, the other, other guy gets the notification. You know, that's how. Uh, do you know who it is? Your musician? No, I don't. It's like some whoever guy. I should. I want to. Yeah, let's whatever. look him up. <laughs> what's up, dude? Totally. Jack in the big funky game. I know, right? How dare you? <laughs> Dude, thanks for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Anytime, Ryan. All right, Yellen. So don't say that, and then I'm just going to come over for the coffee. (laughs) Dude, I'll I'll bring mics just by the coffee. You bring the mics, I'll (laughs) make the coffee. I'll kill it, dude. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Yeah, man. All right, there he is, folks. That's Lyman Big Funky Maderas. Maderos, Maderas. Um, I will have links to all his music up on thebayshed.com. Um, please follow me and uh, the happenings of the Bay Shed. Uh, Instagram at the Bay Shed, Twitter at Bay Shed, uh, Facebook forward slash and or backslash whatever that thing's called the Bay Shed, and um, yeah, stay connected, stay connected, and um, we'll be bringing you some music and some uh, some other things soon. So uh, with that, be good, and I'll talk to you soon.